Welcome to Pacific Mammal Research's Marine Mammal Highlight Series. We are a 501c3 research and education nonprofit studying marine mammals in the Salish Sea off Washington State. In this series, you will learn about different marine mammals as we discuss interesting facts about each species. This is our way to geek out, share some information, and have some fun. We hope you enjoy the series and be sure to follow us on Instagram to vote for which animal we talk about next. And without further ado, Welcome to the Pac-Man Podcast. I'm Cindy. And I'm Kat. And you may have noticed that my voice is a little bit deeper. Uh, I'm a bit <laughs> under the weather right now, so I apologize as my voice is not as melodious as it usually is. If it, I don't know. I just think you're going to have like the, the, the raspy radio but voice. It's the, the Phoebe, right? The, from Friends when she gets sick and she yeah. has like, the like. That's right. Like, yeah. So That's right. Yeah. It's the Phoebe voice. <laughs> So uh, this week we, we, we tried again for the pilot whales. Uh, we put them up against the Peels dolphin. And I think the Peels dolphins are just too cute. Although the pilot whales with their square heads are pretty cute too, but. I was gonna say, I like the picture that you chose for the pilot whales. I feel like that was definitely a good selling picture, but oh well. Yeah, the, the little like flat heads the pilot whales have are, are pretty cute, I think, but they are. we didn't win. They are. Yeah, and the Peels dolphin is very pretty as we'll, as we'll get into. Um, so we will, uh, we'll get to the pilot whale eventually, um, but it was pretty, it was like a two to one uh, win, so. Yeah, it was kind of out of the park. <laughs> it's like, yeah, so like, all right, well, we're doing the peels dolphin, so. Um, and this one's interesting because we, we don't know a whole lot about them, um, but we know some and there's some new stuff happening. So we uh, are actually, uh, since we're, we're down to just Kat and I now, Trevor is off doing more wonderful things in the world. Uh, so we decided to kind of shift how we split up our topics and kind of shift the way we talk about it. So we're going to, um, we're adding in a new feature towards the end, which will be kind of new research on what's happening with the animals um, so that, and Kat will do the threats right before that so we don't end on the bad stuff. <laughs> <laughs> we're very conscious of not leaving you guys on the depressing notes. Right, exactly. We want this to be an uplifting, uh, but realistic uh, podcast. So uh, so that you're just going to notice that shift, um, and I think if we like it, we're going to keep going with that. So without further ado, uh, Kat's going to start us off with where they are, what they look like, and all that fun stuff. Yeah. So let's start with what they look like, because like you said, they are very pretty, and we will have pictures up here. They're really cool. So they're, um, they're also known as black chin dolphins, which we'll get to in just a second, and makes a lot of sense with their coloration. They have a lot of names, too. I know I saw that it's like there's all kinds of like localized names for them I guess mm -hmm. um so in terms of size they are they kind of have more robust bodies um short rounded beak and they are a little bit shorter so they're about four to just under seven feet I think the adults typically are around about six and a half feet ish um <clears throat> the females are slightly smaller than the males but it's by like a few inches so well, it's not something you're gonna <laughs> right it's not something you're going to see like in the wild be like oh there's clearly a female um but there is a little bit of sexual dimorphism there um so basically they have kind of a black or gray coloration on their heads and on their back on their pec fins and on their flukes and then they have kind of like a lighter gray coloring around the eyes and down to the pec fins and then they have this really pretty kind of like thin dark line that runs first of all kind of like under their chin and then they also have one that runs from the tail up to the mid back and along their flank and then they have these really cute little what they call armpits which i thought was adorable these really cute little white spots right behind their pec fins and then a white underbelly so they're really striking like they have their their coloration is beautiful um as and, as as the rest of the lags are right so they're the, the yeah lags. very similar yeah yeah so they are um <clears throat> they are oftentimes mistaken for dusky dolphins mm -hmm. in certain parts of their range because their ranges do overlap a little bit um, and they are, they are the largest of the three lag species in the Southern hemisphere. So, um, getting up to about 220 pounds ish, um, on the higher end with, um, like I said, females slightly less than males. Um, and the younger dolphins are lighter gray than the adults. So in terms of, you know, obviously you'd be able to tell a little bit more with size, but I guess they, their coloration kind of comes in more as they get older, which is interesting. Yeah, that is interesting. I didn't notice that. Yeah. Um, in terms of distribution, like I said, <clears throat> they are found off the southern tip of South America and the Falkland Islands. So it's kind of if you imagine the south southern tip of South America, 
it's almost like a kind of little bubble that goes mm. around the base and, and slightly up the eastern edge of South America. So kind of like, like a, a U going down. Yes, like yes, exactly. Um, so found very frequently around the Tierra del Fuego region in the Magellan Strait, around Cape Horn, and specifically around the Falkland Islands is where a lot of the pictures that I found were taken from. Um, My stuff's from the Magellan region. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Yeah. And like I said, they have had some reports down closer to New Zealand, but those were not confirmed. So yeah. potentially, but that would that would be a new part of their range distribution, and so that was not confirmed. Well, and then yeah, and then all, all like between the Commersons and the Peels and the, and other lags that are there and the Duskies, like you can really easily mistake which one you're saying. Right. Exactly. Um, and I did want to note too, they do actually have quite, again, similar to a lot of the Lagunarinca species, they do have quite a tall falcate dorsal fin as well, which especially for their size, because they are a little shorter and more robust, um, is kind of striking to me. I thought it was quite striking. It is a little taller. They called it, uh, they, I, one place I saw it, they, they said it was like a, a bow ride or a bow wave dorsal fin. Which Ooh. I thought was funny. And I was like, I looked at it, I'm like, okay, well, it is bigger, you know, but it didn't look that different than other dolphin dorsal fins. I wonder if it's because of the coloring, because the coloring kind of does, it It fades from darker in the front to lighter in the back. I so I wonder if maybe that looks like a breaking a wave, breaking wave. wave or something. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so they are found in, in different locations within this region in varying numbers, depending on the time of year. Mm -hmm. They do typically like the coastal, the shallow coastal waters. Um, and they have a lot of association with kelp beds, which I thought was really cool. That was the thing that was um, consistent over everything I saw. They're like, yeah, they like kelp. Like, oh. Yeah, which is really interesting. I think for that's a lot of dolphin species you don't. Yeah, I was going to say, I don't know of yeah. any that like actively associates with kelp beds, which is really cool. Um, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. And I did see some some studies were talking about potential seasonal migration. So they have seen them in, in, in offshore waters as well. Yeah. Um, and it seemed like for some populations that might be more of a seasonal thing. So maybe following a food source that moves into offshore waters or that spawns in offshore waters. Um, yeah. And I'll get but, into that a little <clears throat> bit just with the different places that I'll be talking about that see that kind of stuff. So there does seem to be some variation. Yeah. Which is, I mean, honestly, common for most delphinids. Um, <laughs> right. Exactly. And then they are known to, again, similar to our harbor porpoises out here, actually, they're known to hang, a lot, hang around riptides and fast moving currents and also rocky coasts in addition to kelp beds, which is also pretty cool. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's what I have for their distribution. In terms of population, um, total population estimates are unknown right now. Um, yeah, I but got one on that. You go I have one. Yeah, I found one that said there was there was about twenty one thousand eight hundred individuals in the South Atlantic part of its range. Um, that was from one study, but yeah, that might be the same one. I the only the only abundance estimate that's out there that I know of is is that's the it's the first large scale one that they did was about twenty thousand um, for yeah. the Patagonian coast, the Argentine. Side. Okay. Um, yeah. That was so that would, yeah, that would be the South Atlantic. Yeah. yeah. So that might've been the same, the same I study, so, but yeah, yeah, I mean, again, it's, they're data deficient in the IUCN red list. Um, we just, we don't really know a lot about them. We don't really have a good handle on their population numbers at all. Yeah. Well, 2016 is the first time they've ever done a large scale abundance estimate, you know, yeah. I don't really know a whole lot. <laughs> Which, and again, if you think about it, like there, the waters around that area are really gnarly. I mean, we've talked about well, that like, before with Southern yeah. hemisphere species, but it's, it's, they're very turbulent and there's a lot of storms down there and there's not a lot of visibility, even though they hang out on the coasts a lot. So they are visible right. from shore quite a lot. Trying to get a good count is going to be tricky. <laughs> For sure. Well, and they're not like giant species either. Like they're the largest yeah. of the three lags, but like. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So yeah. I wanted to um, just refresh everybody's, we keep talking about the Lagenorhynchus genus, um, just to let you guys know if other lags might be more familiar in your brain. The other lag species are the Atlantic white-sided dolphin, the white-beaked dolphin, the Peels dolphin, hourglass dolphin, Pacific white-sided dolphin, and the dusky dolphin. So those are the other lags that and you can see that they all have that kind of white and black and pretty color. They're very pretty. Very, They're very gorgeous. pretty. I really, I would love to see them someday. Um, Me too. But no, you'd have to travel very far. So <laughs> we'll see if that ever happens. All right. So that's what you got for abundance and what they look like. Um, yeah. So I'm going to just talk about diet real quick because um, we don't know a lot. <laughs> 
there was like one study that had some a few animals that they did stomach contents on and i think other ones are from observations of of just you know in in the wild but very limited um, but basically they eat demersal fish when demersal means on or at the sea bottom um, and invertebrates so squid octopus fish and crustaceans which i thought was very mm. interesting. Um, and so one of the, the lists that I have, so the crustacean part comes in is shrimp. And that, so first I was like, what they eat like lobster or crab? That's always when I, I think of crustaceans. <laughs> but I forget that shrimp are also crustaceans, but are much more edible easily <laughs> <laughs> than cracking a shell. Um, so we got shrimp, squid, king clip fish, the Argentine hake, southern cod, hagfish, which I thought, those, those, I know, right? You, yeah. I feel bad for the hagfish because they have a horrible name and they look kind of ugly. So you, you just get that like, ew. Well, and they're the ones that, that create slime on themselves, right? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, yeah. they're, they're, they're yeah. one of the jawless fishes. And so they're just, yeah. Um, but apparently tasty for the peels dolphin. Uh, the Patagonian grenadier, the red octopus, other species of herring, mackerel, capelin, anchovies, crustaceans, and even whelks. And whelks are gastropods, like snails. Yeah, they're, they're like snails. Yeah. That was, wow. I was on there. I mean, how, how, how true it is, but <laughs> that was on huh. there. So I don't know if that's, it's probably not a major part of their diet, but there you go. Interesting. I never heard of a cetacean eating a gastropod, but there's something new every day. <laughs> <laughs> um, so because as Kat was saying, they live in the coastal areas, um, they, don't aren't going to need to dive as long like they're not deep divers and they have uh, short dives usually around one to 130 seconds with an average of about 60 seconds so one to two minute dives um, and one interesting thing we really don't know much at all about their um, foraging strategies there just hasn't been a lot done on that um, but they may use tail slaps uh, to herd fish towards other dolphins oh interesting okay yeah, so in one study they saw like this one individual do it like 48 times or something towards something else. So wow. it, 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 that, mm. it's not just like they saw it once and that was it, you know? Yeah. So I thought that was interesting, but that's basically all we know. We kind of know what they eat, kind of a little bit maybe, <laughs> and we don't know much more than that. Um, <laughs> and that's gonna kind of go in through to the behavior part here. Um, most of the behavior that I'll be talking about comes from the Chilean coast. Uh, or Ch Chilean, I guess, um, Chilean, Chilean, um, from Chile. Um, and again, they're strongly associated with those kelp forests. Um, and as Kat mentioned too, they can be seen from shore. So they do tend to be close. However, they, they have a wider distribution than um, the uh, sympatric commerson's dolphins. So commerson's dolphins are in the same area. So, but the Peel's dolphins will have kind of a broader array of areas that they go to than they do. So they okay. prefer open coastline in the northern and deeper bay sand channels in the southern part of the range um, uh, where they frequent rocky coast and riptides, as you mentioned. And a lot of times that's at the entrance to the fjords. And I wanted to say that just because I like saying fjord. <laughs> It's such a cool name. And then you think of like, you know, the, the crazy fjords that you see up in different areas. Um, I don't really think of them down in South America. Mm -hmm. They have so, some beautiful ones down there. Yeah. yeah. So pictures. they apparently will, will go in into those and which makes sense with the riptides and the currents and that kind of thing. Um, they like protected channels and fjords in Southern Chile. Um, and then the shallow continental shelves in the Northern part of the range in Chile and throughout the range in Argentina. So, they can be close to shore in continental shelf areas, but then also close to shore with these deep channels and fjords. So it's, it's, they're found in shallow areas, but what's interesting is that they've been found in shallow areas where they can only get to those areas by crossing deep water. Gotcha, okay. Yeah. Interesting. So, yeah, so most of the times like, oh, they're like shallow, they don't ever go out of shallow water. Um, but these guys do have to cross deep water to get there, mm. um, which is, unusual if you really like shallow water because it's a cold 3d yeah. thing you know, more danger in. Um, so they do have the ability to travel through that which is uh, interesting um the i'm just going to talk about in the strait of magellan uh, in chile they do did have uh, uh an, an estimate of the population there of about 2400 individuals so that 
20,000 is, is that bigger range. And then there's going to be these smaller population pockets that we don't really understand much about. We don't know how separated they are or who, how many in each different population because they haven't been studied, but that one in particular. Um, and that population appears to remain there year round in specific areas that are close to shore. But other observations, so migrations, like you said, to offshore waters, um, uh, they're in, in the Strait of Magellan, there are higher numbers in summer than there are in winter. But in the southern part of their range, the higher numbers are in spring, and that's thought to be a preferred calving area. So they likely, I think there's probably some, like with other populations we've talked about, where you have some that are kind of resident to an area and then others that will migrate back forth. I mean, we even see that with harbor porpoises, right? There's some. That I was just going to say, yeah, mm -hmm. it almost sounds similar to them in the sense of like, you know, being associated with these, these river currents and stuff like that, but also having these slightly, you know, maybe smaller scale, but still certain populations doing these slight seasonal migrations. Exactly. Interesting. Yeah. So we're still learning more about what they do there. Um, as their, for their, their group size, um, there were quite a bit of range there, but it's usually groups of, of, of 20 or less. I saw one that was like, uh, one study that was one to 13 individuals was, was pretty mm. common. Um, so two to 30, uh, they can be a hundred plus strong, but that's rare. So again, very similar to harbor porpoises. Yeah, it's um, fascinating. Yeah, I mean, maybe slightly larger groups than we see harbor porpoises in, but, um, but those large aggregations happen and they're just not sure why. Um, those larger aggregations usually happen in summer and autumn. Um, mm. And lots of times what they have, if they see larger groups, even with like 10 or 12 individuals, they're kind of subdivided into smaller groupings within that larger group. So some of that okay. depends on what you classify as a group, how far apart they have to be to be a separate group, that kind of thing. But yeah. Um, so uh, kind of smaller, they're not like the, and that makes sense because they're coastal larger larger groupings will be found usually in more pelagic waters or tico waters. Mm -hmm. so that kind of makes sense. Um, they're not too acrobatic, uh, but they do apparently very much love to bow ride and wake ride, especially on large vessels. They'll, they even said in one of the, um, in the abundance estimate that their com Commerson's, it was a Commerson's and Peel's dolphin abundance estimates, that theirs might be biased because of their attraction to the boats. So, oh, gotcha. Right. Yeah, the, so that they should maybe um, put in a, a correction factor in, in future studies because they may be drawn well, the, to the Yeah, there was one thing that I was reading too where they said like if you if you turn the engine of the boat off, they like they completely lost yeah. interest. They were like, yeah, oh, like you're, 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 like, you're boring. Yeah. <laughs> right. Like, oh whatever. That was the only reason we were here was because we could bow right on your boat. Like you're gonna turn it off? No, we're done. Bye. Like that's it. Well, you guys suck now, so we're gonna leave. Yeah. yeah. I, I read really that too. Awesome. I thought that was interesting. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Which I mean kind of makes sense, you know, they mm -hmm. don't care about us other than they can get, we can get a bow ride from to them. Yeah. So that was funny. So now this is, next one is one of the favorite things I found. So very common that they, again, don't look, tend to do acrobatics too much like, like some of our other species that we've talked about, but they do jumping, humping, spinning, and tail slapping. <laughs> Would you like to venture again? I had never heard the term humping before. I mean, I heard it, but I'm pretty sure not in context of this. Yeah, so I had never, and apparently it's a, it's from a Wersig and Wersig uh, 1979 paper. Uh, and it's the aerial display where they leap clear of the water and then arch their back strongly. The snout and fluke do not leave the water during the body arch. So I think they jump oh. out and then they flex, but then right. they're still kind of in the water when they do that. So it's like- How interesting. Papers weird okay or like yeah they're just they're creating like a mound like a like a lump at the surface basically yeah exactly weird so, okay Hi. it's cat yes <laughs> she's very excited to see cat um yeah so i thought that was very interesting um i had never heard that before um yeah that's different yeah so uh the what they call noisy leaps like spinning and things like that um they're thinking may provide cues to nearby dolphins about feeding locations like it does for other species and or keep the fish school tightly together. Mm -hmm. So the way of- Yeah, those percussive feet. slaps on the surface, yeah. Exactly. And the last thing I have uh, for um, that is that the uh, they're very, very, they like other dolphins. So they're often seen with commersons and rizzos, but also with Southern right whales, great greaves, um, Magellanic penguins, what? Yeah, kelp gulls, South American sea lions. It's my favorite one. Imperial shags. 
Do you know what kind of species that is? That's a bird because we have shags in Shetland. So okay, I know what a good. shag is. It looks kind of like a cormorant. Like, what is an imperial shag? Yeah, they look a little bit like a cormorant. They, they do, yeah, with a little bit more flourish. Yeah, so uh, it seems like it's often to help them find food, though I, they don't really go into detail about that. I just really want to see Peel's dolphins hanging out with, with penguins. I mean, I mean, seriously, but it makes a lot of sense, especially if they're so coastal. Mm-hmm. You know, they're interacting with a lot more of those land based or, you know, coastal Mostly bird species as well. Right. right. And especially if they're hanging out in kelp beds too, you know. Yeah, that's, and that's where the sea totally lions come in. That makes sense. Yeah. 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 That's very interesting. So I'm curious, like, how much of it is, is active association versus proximity? Right. Yeah. And I don't, they, I couldn't, I couldn't find anything besides them just listing that they're with the other species. Yeah. Which um, I mean, I mean, that's hard to tell if you're just, if you're making just an observation from shore It's like, oh, I just right. see them both in the area. Are they directly interacting? Maybe, maybe not. And it's like but... if they're doing the fish group, I think one day, one, one they were talking about with the birds is that either they're there together for the fish or they saw the birds or heard them or something and then went to the bait ball or they were doing the bait ball and then the birds came to them. You know, like we see yeah. Up here with they're right. all associating together but it's all because there's food already right yep. for sure um but i would love to see appeals dolphin like hold flippers with penguin that'd be super <laughs> <laughs> like best friend that'd be so cool be so cool Ooh, that should be a kid's book a oh my dolphin, gosh yes and penguin. yes yes okay we just made our made our i'll add that book. to my list of kid books that i'm gonna write at some <laughs> <Right>. point <in> <laughs> so many <laughs> oh man speaking of kids that's a great segue um, reproduction is very short because we know nothing. <laughs> <laughs> they give birth between October and April. And that is the, help me out. That's the Southern Hemisphere. Southern spring. Hemisphere. It's Sorry, like, so between October and April? Yeah. So it's like spring that summer. Would, yeah, it'd be their spring summer. Yeah. Mm. <clears throat> it always blows my mind every time I think about it being opposite. Um, so as then they said as early as October and that's kind of on the early end. Got it. Um, Everything else is because they assume it's similar to other lag species. So the gestation is 10 to 12 months. They nurse for one to maybe two years. Again, that's just based on others. Um, they have no specimens that were collected or found with the fetus inside. So they can't look at that. Um, they did, there's one study that looked at females and that older females had more ovarian scars. And one female had at least eight pregnancies and like a few others that weren't, didn't result in pregnancies. So I think they, use that a little bit um, and they know very little about male sperm activity so that's mm. pretty much and we don't know when they become sexually mature and we don't know how long they live <laughs> yeah which i'll get to i'll get to the living part and the, the age range in um i do have a couple fun facts actually for this one but um yeah it's very va- I mean, again it reminds me of harbor porpoises which is really yeah. funny so we'll 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 touch on that a little bit later too yeah exactly so it's we we know very little and that's what we know um, so with that, um, we will get into the threats and then the new research that's, that's out on them um, after we take a quick break. We'll be right back. Okay, and we're back, and now Kat is going to give us the threats, which um, are likely very similar to, again, most of the other ones that we talk about, but I'm sure there are some little tidbits that are, are interesting. Yeah, so this one is, um, I mean, so I guess just up front, we can 
say that yes, there will definitely be some overlap with a lot of the other species we've talked about. So things like climate change, obviously are going to impact these guys in terms of finding food, in terms of their, especially in the Southern hemisphere, um, there usually is more association with, um, especially like seawater temperature um, and the fish species down there. So of course that's going to be an issue for these guys. So one of the really interesting things though with these guys was um, that they are, they are at risk from active hunting for crab bait. Which I think was crazy. I'm like, really? Isn't that gnarly? There's so nothing else is, you could use? I know. So, this, well, and this is the thing where it, presumably this just, the dolphin meat works really well for right. catching oh, crab, I yeah. guess. But so because these guys are so coastal, they are obviously more easy to catch, I guess, than a lot of other dolphin species. They're right mm -hmm. there. The fishermen don't have to go very far. They don't have to go right. offshore. Well, they go like right to your boat. <laughs> right, exactly. They're fall yeah, they're likely following your boat. Um, so historically, they were hunted really vigorously, like by the thousands for crab bait, um, especially during the 1970s and 80s. I guess that was very, very common. And while it has decreased substantially, it's still technically legal really? to kill these dolphins for bait. Yeah, what? I know. So apparently the government of Chile has recently taken steps to prevent this from occurring as much. It's still technically legal, but they are trying to basically get a, a localized ban at least in place so yeah i mean like i said the numbers are down but it's still a big concern for these guys and i think it's really important to note that simply because we don't know what their population numbers right. are we don't know what the and if, potential biological removal is, uh, okayness is yeah exactly and so i mean if they were being taken by the thousands like crazy that's anyway so that's that's the biggest threat for the peels dolphin which is very different than other species we've talked about but yeah nobody especially for bait and so i'm like okay so maybe dolphin meat works really great for crabs why crabs don't eat dolphin so is it all of a sudden like they've been given like caviar and they're like wow this is the most delicious thing i've ever tasted yeah because i mean crab also don't eat chicken and that's one of the most common things that people use around here to catch crab is chicken huh yeah. So I don't, I mean, crab eat anything. They're, they're, well, they're, yeah, they're, they're scavengers. Yeah. Right. So, I mean, presumably they've just found that this, I, I mean, again, I have no idea, but I am presuming there's a reason for this. Right. And again, if you have them in close proximity and it's, it's relatively easy to catch them or something, I don't know. Well, and I guess if you have one, like that's a lot of crab meat versus catching one fish. How, how, much. right. So that kind of, makes which then if you think if they're being caught by the thousands, how much crab they're catching. That's a whole other level of unsustainability that we can talk about. Right. Okay. So moving on. Right. Um, again, as part of that, another threat for these guys is, of course, in incidental catch. So this is what we would call directed catch. Um, incidental catch is when they're being by caught in things like fishing nets. So, of course, again, they're, they're in the same vicinity as a lot of fishermen. They're very coastal. Um, gill netting in particular is quite dangerous for these guys. Um, they can get wrapped up in the gill nets very easily. Very similar to the harbor once again. Yeah, exactly. Um, and again, if they're, you know, they're fishing, likely fishing for the, a lot of the same species that are being um, taken by the fishermen. So mm -hmm. um, the last one that I have, like I said, in addition to the more kind of general ones that we've already, you know, talked about in multiple other episodes is pollution, but specifically org organochlorines. Um, mm -hmm are a big source of issue for these guys. So again, because they're coastal, they are at a much higher risk of contamination because a lot of that runoff, you know, it's most concentrated right around that coastal area before it gets washed out to sea and can be dispersed in, in the open ocean. Right. Um, so you're talking, in, you know, runoff from things like industry and housing areas um, as, weather, as well as from boat-based pollutants. So like oil spills, bottom paint chipping off, you and know, all those things. You know, yeah. Correct. Yeah. So, but I, I, know, I found in several studies where they were talking about specifically organochlorines um, as a concern for Peel's dolphins. Well, and I wonder too, if that's <clears throat> the difference in what's been banned and when it's been banned, right? So in, in America, yeah. it's been banned maybe a lot longer than in other places and some places still use some of these things. And so maybe the currents too, like that might be a whole thing. Yeah, that's a really great point. And I guess, I mean, the only other one that I did have um, is just, there are more and more tourist industry um, boats that are going out around these areas, specifically around like the Falkland Island areas. And um, that is of course, because these guys love to bow ride. You know, <laughs> it's likely not necessarily detrimental, but of course that does add to the background noise in the area, um, which can help, you know, prevent or cause issues with communication and or disturbance of if they're feeding, for example, it can change their behavioral state. So just something right. to note. 
Exactly. So yeah, um, it's one of those things where it's balanced. It's like it's good that they're doing that, which is killing them, but there's the other things that go along with that. Yeah, exactly. And especially I think that's a really good point in this species in particular, because that might actually be so helpful for education to quell this, you know, this culling for crab bait, right. which is which is worse. Well, obviously the non-direct kill is gonna be better, right? Right. So yeah, when yeah, you have that's a really good point. That's definitely the choice to make. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so should I do my fun facts now or should I do them after our research? No, let's do the new research and next I have a couple okay. of facts too. So we'll see if we have the same ones for okay. Ones. So that was all I had for threats. It's not okay. extensive <laughs> for once. Did, it was interesting though that they have that, that the crab meat monks and I saw that too and I was like, I couldn't believe it. I was like, really? Yeah. In this, in this day and age, you know, but what can you do? Uh, hopefully stop it. But <laughs> education is the key. Um, so I did find some new studies. So it's interesting is that most of the studies that have been done were like 1993, 1997, and then maybe a couple in the early 2000s. And then the recent ones were like 2019 and 2020. So mm. you have this really big vacant section in the, in the middle, at least from um, what I did. I didn't do an extensive search, but um, even the 2019, 2020 pa papers all reference just the 1993, 1997 studies. So um, it, it's interesting that there's such a large break, um, but there was one in 2020, and this one I think I talked about when we, I think we were doing the Dusky episode, so check that out if you haven't already, um, but they, um, the peeless dolphins also use the narrowband high-frequency clicks, like porpoises do, and the, um, uh, some of the others, so it's interesting because that it is similar to the hourglass dolphin, one of the other lags, um, that supports the close phylogenetic affinity to of those two species to the dolphins in Cephalorhynchus. So the Cephalorhynchus genus, let me pull it up so I don't mess up. I left it up. The they are the Commerson's, the black dolphin, heavy sides, and Hector's dolphin. Yeah. So, so the black the, dolphin is also known as the Chilean dolphin. Yeah, the Chilean dolphin, right? And they do overlap. Mm -hmm. That's one of the other ones that they overlap with. The, many of the studies are looking at. Commerson's and peels and Chilean dolphins and peels. Um, and so uh, they, um, they have that, which is, which is interesting. Um, and they are one of the only other ones, I have this here somewhere, now I can't see where it is, but that, that they outside of uh, the Cephalorhynchus don't, I believe, and then these guys that don't have whistles, at least that they don't. Yeah, yeah, um, exactly. Yeah, so really, really interesting there of similarities between different species in different habitats, similar to porpoises, mm -hmm. right? They, as far as we know, just have the clicks and not any whistles. So that was kind of cool. Um, and so that goes into the genetics of like, well, are should they be cephalorhynchus or should they be lags? Like, right. where does that distinction happen? Um, and I'm sure many geneticists are looking into, into that and will we'll tell us eventually. Um, but what's interesting is that they saw the difference between the vocalizations of peels and commerson's dolphins that, are, that overlap in range. Um, it's just enough that would allow for species recognition. So, oh, that, cool. so if, you're, if you're yelling in the same spot, you need to know if your yell is coming back as you or for the commerson's dolphins, for example. Mm -hmm. um, so even though it would be hard for us to maybe tell the difference, it was big enough for them to be able to tell who's who and, and, and whatnot. Um, and then, as I think we talked about with the dusky, uh, it's an adaptation for life in acoustically cluttered intro waters. So the, uh, those narrow bands don't get all like, ah, back at you. <laughs> um, yeah, they're very focused. Are, yeah, exactly. So you don't have a lot of back, um, uh, what's the word, like when you have feel like feedback and stuff when you yes. get too yeah. much from other places from when they bounce off everything. Um, and then also, again, similar to harbor porpoises, having those near bed high frequencies keeps you somewhat concealed from predators like killer whales uh, that would hear you when you're clicking uh, if you had yeah. regular clicks. So that was kind of cool. Um, in 2019, there was a, a bigger study on the Chilean dolphins. Uh, again, all of these are really just looking at uh, like abundance, uh, not even abundance, but like distribution and habitat use more than any kind of social structure or anything like that. Um, so they again confirmed uh, as the 1993, 97 studies did, that they use wider range, uh, a wider range of conditions than, for example, the Chilean dolphins. And I think the same thing when they looked, another study looked at Commerson's, that the, um, the Peels dolphins have a wider area, area 
and choice of habitat than those other species do. Um, they like um, more open and exposed coastlines compared to the Chilean. Um, and, but both of them have to navigate extensive salmon and shellfish farming sites um, mm. to transit in between areas of important habitat. So again, and they can go over the deep water. So they're a bit more complex than some of the other species, I think, which makes them more difficult to understand. Yeah, for sure. Um, and there was spatial habitat partitioning between those two species. So um, similar to probably like the dolls and, and the harbor porpoise we have here, where the harbor likes the coastline more and dolls like a little bit deeper water. Um, that's likely what's it, something like that is occurring there. Um, they had depth and distance to shore and distance to rivers were important predictors for the occurrence of the animals. So those kind of environmental variables. Um, they can occur offshore over shallow sandbanks or shoals. So again, and similar to harbor porpoises, where how far off you find them really depends on how far the continental shelf can go. Um, and then if they're also able to traverse deep water, they can go find these shoals and sandbanks that are kind of hidden. So it looks like they're offshore, but they're still really coastal because of the mm. shallow water. Mm -hmm. right. um, they're found along wider and deeper channels. So again, those fjords, they like to go into those more than um, maybe the Chilean dolphins do. Um, and this is, as you alluded to, likely due to prey preferences. Um, in this study, they didn't see them feeding on small schooling fish, um, which would make sense if they're more in coastal versus deeper waters. You're not going to have those bait balls as much. Um, right. And they can transit between more of these patchily distributed or less productive prey patches. So because they have, because they can do that, they can be in a wider area than another species that needs to have that more consistent, like where the prey is. Right. Um, so for example, in Chilean fjords, they were found tens of kilometers from shore, but always in water that was less than hundred meters. Gotcha. Okay. So, so it's more the depth than the distance from shore. Correct. Exactly. Right. And so where the topography okay. of the, uh, or the bathymetry of the ocean dictates where they can go. Mm -hmm. um, and so this, this greater ecological plasticity, so being able to move between those places, um, is to be expected with their much wider distributional range, right? So because they can do that, they can be a little bit more plastic in um, where they eat and, and where they're going, what they're doing. Um, and because they span both the Southern Pacific and South Atlantic continental shelf waters, which are different. Like the Atlantic and the Pacific are, are different beasts of ocean. Um, so they have a, even though they're, they're not widely distributed around the world, they have a wide distribution of habitats that they can get within that area. Um, mm -hmm which might go into what we're gonna talk about with the genetics folk in, in just a second, uh, with their ability to, to sustain themselves. Um, and they had less strong relationships with environmental correlates in habitat models. So it was, you know, some animals is like, definitely with riptides, definitely with this depth, definitely with this. They had more of a variation in, in, in that there wasn't as strong relationships with like certain ones. So again, that ecological plasticity, and that's gonna help you in the long run, right? <laughs> Because if something happens to one place, you're okay because you can you have that ability to adjust and go to a different different habitat. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so the uh, last uh, one I'm going to talk about is the genetics, and this was done in the interjurisdictional marine coastal Patagonia Austral Park. Okay then, or PIM CPA. Um, but uh, they did this with commercians um, and what's really cool. Okay, so they didn't do like stranded dolphins. They did skin scamples from a pole system. Oh, nice. Yeah, so which you don't That's hear that cool. often with smaller dolphins because yeah. it's hard to do. But I guess if they bow right a lot, you can just like, Boop. Right. Do that. Interesting. So they, yeah, they did it with a pole system. They found a one-to-one -one male female ratio um, and they had moderate levels of genetic diversity. So even though they're isolated to this one area, they still have, they haven't been isolated genetically, right? Mm -hmm. And this is gonna to correspond to the ecological stuff we just talked about. They found in another study um, a few years earlier, there are two ecotypes in that, um, and they did that from stable isotopes. So looking at their, um, the isotopes that they found in their bodies. Um, there's no overlap in the isotopic niches, suggesting that there are spatial partitioning in depths or distance from shore for those two ecotypes. So basically some are basically more coastal and some are a bit more offshore. Um, and this again may correspond with genetic diversity because if you have differences in foraging, foraging strategies that can lead to genetic differences if they're kept separate for the most part. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's why they have this 
greater plasticity and this greater genetic diversity that allows them to not have issues. Right. Um, and that goes into the fact that there has been a stable population over the last 10,000 years. So in other marine mammal species in that area, they've had range expansions, right? So that something's changed and the animals have moved or, um, or, or expanded because you know, certain barriers have been removed, um, but they have not. So they've been able to kind of be stable for the last 10,000 years. And that likely has to do with that ecological partitioning and genetic diversity that has allowed them to, to, to do that. Um, they found in 2016, they found two hotspots in density consistent with medium to high primary productivity zone, which you alluded to earlier. And it's the Golfo San Jorge, Jorge and south of uh, Tierra del Fuego, which is uh, what you mentioned before. So uh, they're starting to see some patterns you know, in their distribution um, and linking that with productivity. Um, so that, um, and the only other thing I had from the, the, um, that abundance estimate that we talked about earlier um, was that the peels had a wider offshore distribution and actually sea surface, sea surface temperature was a good predictor for peels because they live oh, in cold okay. temperate shelf water. So if those change, um, that would be a stronger effect on them than right. the deeper animals. So, um, gotcha. yeah, so that's kind of cool. They've, they've learned quite a bit, but again, it's still just about, you know, kind of distribution habitat use and some abundance now because so there's still a lot. Yeah. Um, so that's the kind of new research that's happening in the world of Peel's dolphins. And it's nice that you, you see that there's more coming out. And one of those studies was done by somebody from St. Andrews, which I thought. Oh, cool. Awesome. Yeah. yeah. So um, there are people out there looking at them, which is good because we need to know more about them so we can protect them. Yeah. Um, so fun facts. Why don't you start off, Kat, if you have some fun. Yeah. So going back to the age thing. So I found one one place where it said that the oldest Peel's dolphin recorded in the wild was 13 years old. Interesting. Yeah. And yet what's interesting is everywhere where I looked for an age range of like how long they live naturally. And it, it's, it's taken based on similar dolphins. It's not yeah. based on Peel's dolphins. So they're that's, that's all like, I about 20, just... 25 years in the wild mm -hmm. and like up to 40, but that's really just gen generically it's dolphins. dolphins. Yeah. Right. So if that's correct, and the oldest one recorded in the wild was only 13. They're very much like harbor porpoises. They're, but again, it just reminded me of harbor porpoises, where again, it's anywhere from age 25 years old. Mm -hmm. Like we don't know. Um, so I thought that was fascinating. And especially given how many, again, as we talked about before, how many have been already taken out of the population for crab right. bait. Um, if they're only living to 13-ish, I right. mean, you know, say like just 13, 15, if that is actually representative of the population, that's, that's a very different picture than a well, long lived animal. I found it interesting too, that they, you know, their, their reproduction was similar. If they're having, they're nursing for one to two years, maybe that's the same kind of thing as a harbor porpoise, where they're nursing either right. every year or every other year. If they're having babies that quickly, they probably have a shorter lifetime. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So very interesting. Um, and then the only other one that I had is because um, I wanted to dive into a little bit where they got their name. Yes. Do the name. Um, so, yeah. So this species is named after Titian Ramsey Peel, who is an American explorer, artist, and naturalist who first discovered or, well, didn't discover, first noted the species mm -hmm. um, in 1848. Yeah, I so thought it was a very long time ago. I was like, oh. Yeah. <laughs> I know. Well, and if you think about it, like 1848, I cannot imagine having to navigate those waters in like a like sailboat. Yeah. <laughs> well, oh my goodness. Like, no, yeah. Yeah. Um, so I, here, I, I knew I had it somewhere, but I put it in the fun facts. It's plowshare dolphins. That's their other nickname. Oh, Because the water splashes up one. high around their faces when they swim rapidly. So it's similar oh. to the dolls. It's called the rooster tail splash, I think, but they yep. call them plowshare dolphins. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. Hmm. So I don't know. Um, cool. And the, the only other ones I had were what we already talked about with being the largest of the lags and the only dolphin outside of cephalorhynchus mm -hmm. penis that doesn't whistle. Yeah. So like really, maybe they should be cephalorhynchus. Which I mean, genetics, you know, that stuff goes back and forth all the right. time. We discover new things and well, you know, species the get moved around. That, Atlantic spotted dolphins are genetically more related to bottomless dolphins than they are to other spotted dolphins, but they have spots. So obviously you put them with the spotted dolphins. So yeah, it's confusing. Genetics throws a monkey wrench in the middle of things, but <laughs> also helps, but then just, you know, it's, it's hard. Where, where do you draw the line of what the genetics is showing versus 
the morphological, right? Whereas, it, right. You know, and that's, and, yeah. and we're all drawing the lines, right? They don't, <laughs> they don't care. Yeah. So it's, it's interesting to see how that intersects as we learn more and more about their genetics and um, if they can get them off of poles then that's cool and they'll be able to learn more. Cause it's interesting though that they don't actually have that many stranded it seems even though they're fairly coastal but if the waters are so turbulent there that maybe they just that's what i'm wondering mm-hmm. yeah Especially in the or if there's just too, not like the this. research there might just not be the research effort in that area too if they True. are stranded animals or is there anyone there to collect it and and do a necropsy on yeah it? i don't know how populated it is around those areas and then if they're right towards there's no beach to wash up on it's just a rock yeah so they get beaten across until they sink or get eaten so it probably yeah. has to do with the with the habitat as well and um, multiple factors, but um, mm-hmm. it makes it more difficult to learn from the stranded animals than other species. So hopefully yeah. they can learn more from the living ones and not all get taken for crab bait. That'd be good. Yes, yeah. also good. Yeah. So um, that is the Peels dolphin. Uh, again, we'll have a picture up here on uh, for the YouTube channel if you're listening to it there. Uh, but if you're listening to it on our um, uh, the regular podcast, be sure to go look up the Peels dolphin or go to our go to our YouTube. <laughs> click on this one because um, they are very beautiful and hopefully we'll be learning more about them uh, in the future so um, next time I will probably go back to a general review I think we don't have an interview lined up right now but if you have any topics that you guys want us to talk about please get in touch with us on social media Instagram or Facebook or email and be sure to check out our uh, our, our our gift store on our website because uh, all the money goes back into the research and producing stuff like this for you guys so if you feel the need for some Pac-Man merch, uh, cute stuffed animals, uh, anything like that, um, go ahead and check that out. And uh, we will, I don't know, we'll see if we'll do the pilot whale again or give them a break, I'm not sure. Uh, it just doesn't seem to be doing well against the things that we pick. So <laughs> we'll, we'll get back to the, if we don't do the pilot whale in the next poll, we'll, we'll get back to it and see if we can uh, have, him, have them win. But they are really cool, so. Um, So with that, that is it up for this week and we will see you next time. Bye. Bye. This was brought to you by Pacific Mammal Research, a 501c3 nonprofit organization. To learn more about the species we discuss, check out our blog. Head to our website, www.pacmam.org, that's P-A-C-M-A-M dot org, to check it out. Also, help us continue providing fun and educational content like this by donating today. Your help is how we can continue to do our work and share it with you. Thanks.